Um, so first question, what is the importance of hiring a professional DJ with experience versus a family friend, someone with no experience, plugging an iPod into a speaker? What's your take on that? So, it, you know, I understand that weddings and corporate events are expensive ventures, but the, the DJ, in my opinion, you know, I'm biased clearly, but is the second most important cog in the wheel behind the wedding planner. We also function as the master of ceremonies and our job is to be the second pair of eyes on the room as a whole. Uh, look, you know, a good experienced DJ is looking beyond their laptop and has total room awareness and situ situational awareness all times. And I think a point of pride for us is we can often help catch things if, no matter how amazing a planner is, if they're engaged in handling something or putting out a fire, they can only do so many things at once. And I think as the DJs, a lot of times we're the second line of defense of catching something or, hey, it's time to do toast, but I realize that the photographer is changing lenses or the mother of the groom is in the bathroom. And these are these are small moments that in themselves aren't event ending, but when they start to stack up, uh, it all comes together in terms of creating a completely fluid, seamless event and delivering the dream that most couples have. And then on, I'll just add on top of that, along with a professional comes, insurance and being a licensed business and having backup equipment and backup DJs and uh, just how we approach the the preparation before the event and post event as well and I, and I will just clarify I always def we always good DJs always defer to the coordinator we're not here to create power struggles it's not about ego it's about coming together as a team and all of us working uh, syncing and working in conjunction to deliver the best experience possible for the guests. Talking about DJ and MC jobs, I know a lot of people do do both. I know some events call for two separate people. What's your take on it? Do you DJ and MC? Do you think there are events that call for one DJ and an MC to handle them differently? What's your take? I've done both situations. I think it depends. Some of it depends on the client's needs and the level of engagement that they're looking for. Actually, I think a lot of it depends on that. I've done hundreds of weddings where I've run it myself. I'll typically have a setup team or a setup assistant, but when it comes down to running the show, um, I do find that having a second person can help narrow the window of awkward moments or uncomfortable silences. If, for instance, there's ways around that, like setting up two mics, but you know, if you're trying to fade music and run over and introduce someone and present a mic to them, uh, which is always preferred as opposed to doing it from behind the booth, which could uh, appear to look lazy to, to some guests. So, but it's really the dynamic. The one thing I would say to clients is there's a difference between a two-man show that is there strategically as a two-man show for a reason versus a DJ that has an MC just because the DJ isn't that experienced and needs someone to help cover. So I see that a lot where people are hiring friends or they're hiring, oh, my friend's a club DJ and you know he's gonna have his friend come. That would make me nervous for a couple because that lends to lack of experience as a whole. But I, I think in our onboarding meeting, our discovery calls, we really try to get a sense of how much interaction the, the couple wants. Um, and then I'll make recommendations based on that. So the short answer is I think both are fine and both have a time and a place, you know, just depending on the needs and what kind of energy you're trying to generate for the, for the room. Here, I'm assuming you've worked alongside bands in the, in the past here. What's, uh, what's your take on working alongside bands? Do you think it's wise for people to hire a DJ when also hiring a band? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if budget allows, it's great to have a DJ and band in tandem for a couple reasons. One, some people really enjoy the energy that a live band brings. Um, DJs can't compete with that. But no matter how good a band is, and I know some amazing bands, uh, they have a limited repertoire, so a DJ can fill the gaps. And then some guests really like, again, no matter how amazing a band is, some people want to hear the original version of Single Ladies or whatever their favorite song is. So having, having that balance. And then also, bands inevitably take breaks. Some bands take a lot of breaks. And being able to have a DJ that can immediately fill that void and maintain the energy levels while, while the band is on break. Uh, but I would say that it's important to have a DJ that is experienced and has their ego checked 
we, you don't want to see a power struggle or a competition for attention. My thought is if I'm working with a band, um, there was a saying once that said, if you're invited to dinner, help set the table, don't try to serve the main course if you're not the chef. So if I'm in tandem with the band, I always ask for their set list just to make sure that we don't unintentionally, if we go on before them or on the breaks, burn any songs that are in their set list. And then also try to maintain whatever they end, energy level they end with, I'll try to meet it. And then if I spike in that 20 minute break, I'll strategically step my energy down a little bit to set the band up for success. So when they come back on, like they, they, you know, it's like, ah, so right. I think, um, I think it's important to understand how to work with a band, but yeah, if budget allows, I think it's great uh, to have both. Um, all right. So moving on, what are your top words of advice to clients looking for a DJ MC for their wedding event, looking for the right fit, right budget? What are your kind of top words? Keep this in mind when you're looking at DJs. I'll do a shameless plug for my book. I wrote a book a few years ago called How to Hire a Killer Wedding DJ. Right. Uh, it's available on Amazon now, uh, but uh, it's, also, it's also a free PDF, so um, I'm happy to share it. And that was, kind of, I kind of put everything in there for couples that aren't sure. You know, if you've never planned a wedding, a lot of times you're not sure what you need. Uh, you don't know what you don't know. And also we have to remember that it's overwhelming for couples. They're they're looking for on average 12 different vendors and they're told to start with five to seven in every vendor category and narrow down to three. In a perfect world, that's what my first recommendation is. You start a little broad, narrow down to three, then reach out and schedule interviews or phone, now probably Zoom, but mm -hmm. we always ideally like to sit down and have take you to take a couple of coffee and have a chat. Um, it's a two-way interview. We don't take every client. And so yeah, I think it's important to make sure that there's really chemistry, you know, that you, you, you feel that we feel comfortable, but also you as the client feel like this person gets us. Um, so, the, you know, that's the first thing is doing your diligence and narrowing down to a few solid options. If budget is an issue, maybe finding a low, middle, high um, price point of, you know, three different DJs and then through conversations and seeing if they have mixes and checking online reviews um, or seeing who they've worked with. That's a good question. What vendors or venues do you traditionally work with? Because that can be the mark of a professional um, versus someone who doesn't have a list at all. Um, and then ultimately it comes a bit down to your, your instinct and your gut feeling about who feels like a good match for you. One game I love to play, if I, we have a couple or a client that's very particular about music, we'll play the match game where I'll say, send me five or 10 artists or songs and I'll email you back with five or 10 more that I think you'd be into. And I find that's a really quick way to gain their confidence because yeah. um, the rub with planners and DJs is we're the most important elements of the, the wedding or event, but we're the least tangible to gauge during the purchase process. Mm -hmm. So it can be really difficult. And that's often why, you know, I'm, I have the angel of Alan Berg sitting on my shoulder. He's like, that's why the first question people have is how much are you or what do you cost? Because they don't know what else to ask. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, finding a DJ that will take the time, sit down with you and chat and kind of walk you through what you should be asking and prompt those things for you is, is the best way to go working with clients to select those songs for each moment. I mean, we got so much music out there nowadays. So what's your take on kind of helping them, giving them advice, helping them through the process, making it easy? You know, I always think once we have contact and we end up booking, I say, keep a, keep a note on your, your iPhone or, you know, your computer. And then whenever you're in a car or whenever songs start, because yeah, some clients like to sit down and do it like homework. And we, we have a few different tools. We have an online tool. Um, we have a Google Doc or questionnaire that we send out. And then we have a bunch of song uh, playlists that we can send as a resource. Some clients like to sit down and do it like homework and just knock it out in one shot. And I think other clients, it's kind of a fluid process. And I like to remind clients, if your wedding is a year away, don't knock out your playlist now in its entirety because new music is gonna come out. You're gonna fall in and out of love with songs between now and then. So it's a free flowing process. And we usually ask clients to submit their final music request list about 
30 days to two weeks prior to the wedding and that gives them a window to make those last minute adjustments. You know, clients, as I'm sure you've experienced, if they're very musically savvy and very musically passionate, they, they'll be all over it and then they might have a three page Excel spreadsheet broken down by category and then we'll go over it and make recommendations. Sometimes it's just a little bit of fine tuning. Hey, I noticed that you put the song in dinner, but it's a little intense. It's a little abrasive. It might be better in cocktail hour or this song is great, but it, you put it in dancing, but it's not really danceable. Could we maybe play that right after the cake and it's a good filler song. We do a, you know, a, which is pretty common with DJs, a must play, try to play, do not play mm -hmm. category. And I tell clients the least, it's all important, but the least important to focus on is cocktail hour because people are usually mingling and you're off doing photos at that point anyway. So I always say start, you know, start with ceremony music and then all the special songs and then let's plug in dinner and dancing. And uh, for the clients, as you mentioned, that not everyone is super passionate about music. Maybe they're foodies and it's less of a thing. So then I'll just ask them to give as much as they're comfortable with. As soon as it mm -hmm. starts to stress them out, then I say stop. And by then, hopefully we've already, um, we've already gained their trust. So it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. You throw as many pieces on the board as you want and a professional DJ's job is to take those pieces and extrapolate and add more pieces if needed to make the puzzle come together. All right, so crazy loaded question here. What are the ingredients to make a packed dance floor? What does it take? lots of alcohol <laughs> i mean there's it's called social lubricant for a reason so uh I, open bar definitely helps but um ultimately the obvious answer is a great dj with amazing room awareness and with an ability to understand how to generate and curate and maintain energy but the less obvious answer which i talk about in my book how to hire a killer wedding dj available now on amazon um is venue selection uh room layout and a proper timeline um i'm sure you've experienced this i i've i always like to do a walkthrough or see the floor plan before if i'm not already familiar with the space but there have been a couple occasions where that's not possible and i walk in and i haven't even set up my equipment and i can already tell i'm completely sunk because the room is way too big so the, the, the venue just filled in extra tiles on the dance floor. So now the dance floor is also way too big. We didn't do up lighting because there was a budget. So the lighting levels are not correct. The bar is outside in the foyer and the photo booth is on the patio. Uh, we're sunk, you know, so it's, it's all of those things. It's hiring an amazing DJ um, that understands you and understands how to read a crowd and make adjustments. Um, to me, that's almost ob obvious. So that's why I like to talk about all the other aspects logistically. We were amazing, but we're not magicians. And if the room is not set up and the, the timeline is set up inappropriately, um, then there's a lot of things that can torpedo our best efforts. So a lot of our consultation is, again, without going into a power struggle, is being able to see the timeline and get on a phone call with the client and the planner and make some subtle suggestions about shifting things here and there, um, you know, on the timeline to ensure success. A, a perfect example that I'm, I'm sure you've experienced. Um, I love photographers, I love videographers, but my number one pet peeve and challenge in the last few years is photographers that book a package where they end at 10 and we're taking the room till midnight. So now our ability to let a timeline flow naturally and, and take, to me, cake and bouquet, those are fillers. Those are things to use to fill dead space or downtime when we've lost the floor or people have danced for 40 minutes and they're tired. Everyone else looks at it as like a focal point, but I think as DJs, we look at it as shuffling these pieces around. But if the photographer leaves by 10 and we have to front load everything on the timeline, it kills our whole ability to man manage and maintain energy organically. So really being aware of the timeline and how things are spaced out is, is uh, along again with venue, venue selection and lay room layout, I think really are critical to a packed dance floor. And so that's another thing I'll talk to guests about is, Success or failure in a, of an event is not ruled by the dance floor. It is a barometer, and I understand again, it, you know, that 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 you look to the floor um, to kind of gauge how a room feels. But there's a whole lot more going on. So, 
That also is in the discovery call to get a sense of what, making sure that their vision is realistic. Yeah. Um, a, oh, uh, another point that reminds me of is length. Reception length is a huge one. I've, I always talk, I often talk people out of five or six hour receptions because it's about, do you want to end on a high note? Uh, it's like a race. Do you want to have everyone hit the finish line at once with a big photo finish? Then you run a short race. If you have a marathon, people get tired and they fall out and then it's an anticlimactic ending. If that's okay for a couple, great. I have no agenda, but let's just make sure we're all these things were realistic about it. So um, the, the the length of it, and and like I said, I've had plenty of successful events, as I'm sure you have, where the song selection and the energy is on point, and the room feels amazing, and we didn't have much dancing, but tons of compliments afterwards, and we allowed people to enjoy the space naturally, the way they wish to enjoy it. That becomes a lot more important when you book. A really unique venue you know if you're in a hotel ballroom and there's ugly corporate carpet and four square walls dancing becomes a lot more important and having a DJ that can really maintain that energy if you book a place like um, La Venta and Palos Verdes where there's like all these different areas and a patio in front and a beautiful view in the back the reality is people are going to drift and and you spent the money on a really interesting space it's okay to let people enjoy that space and not force them to be congregated in one area all right do you know of any misconceptions about djs that you hear anything you want to set right oh well one would be for events where dancing is not the priority like let's say a networking event a fundraiser a cocktail party a mixer sometimes people say Oh, we're not trying to spend a lot of money. The DJ is not that important. People aren't going to dance. So that would be a misconception where no, the energy in the room is still very important. And if the DJ doesn't understand, it can actually be harder for less experienced DJs to program music for a room without a dance floor. Uh, they, they lose control of their energy curve and now the music is way too intense and it's off-putting and you, suddenly you see everyone move outside or they are just like, hey, I'm just going to play lounge music and the room feels very sleepy and people start leaving. Uh, so, you know, we have had, we had a good reputation. I, I used to do a lot of premiere parties and rap parties and I was successful for that reason because I think that there's, uh, it's a very specific skill set being able to program a room because when they're dancing, you have an immediate way to gauge if you're successful or not based on if they're on the floor or they're not. But all these other environments, um, it's the music and the energy is just as important. That would be the one I would hit on. Your approach working with your clients, the planner, your, your photographers, you've got potentially three or more timelines kind of being made and then on the day of they kind of all come together. Go into some detail again on just kind of your overall thoughts and process on making sure that everyone's together as a team on the day of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we always like to reach out to the, the planner, to the venue, if we're not familiar with it, introduce ourselves, ask if we can do a walkthrough, have a chat with the coordinator, kind of gauge how flexible the coordinator is if, if they're open to input. Again, because there's usually a couple things that I see from a DJ perspective on timelines. Um, the, the one example is, um, Often on a plan, a uh, timeline, it will say, cut the cake, dancing resumes. And you and I know that more often than not, the cake is our nemesis. It's gonna kill the dance floor. People have this irrational fear that if they're not seated at their table, they're not gonna get their cake. And uh, mm -hmm. so sometimes we can keep the energy high or if they don't want to announce the cake, but it's unrealistic to assume that we're gonna stop everything, send people over, cut the cake and immediately pack the dance floor again. So yes, I like to look at those things and then give input on how we can optimize it to, um, to make everything as seamless as possible. And checking in the day of, introducing ourselves to the photographers and, you know, a lot of photographers get um, thrown under the bus by DJs or we suddenly just announce something and maybe the coordinator is busy and no one gave the photographer a heads up that we've moved up the toast. So I always like to just say, hey, if you need anything, I also have a copy of the timeline if you don't have one so you don't have to bother the coordinator, come check in with me. And also I will always look for you before we do anything. And like I see such a wave of relief come over the, the photographer, the videographers, because that they have to explain later to the couple why they didn't get that million dollar shot Right. If suddenly I just said, and now the first dance. Um, 
So yeah, it's all it's I think it's all of those things. Um, and then doing, you know, doing a final call just the days prior to the event just to check in with everybody again and um, you know setting us up for success and making sure we're we're all functioning well as a team. We already mentioned this but everyone else is kind of focused on their their part of the day but I really feel like the DJ is is with all due respect, you know, again, we we don't get into power struggles but we're kind of the second planner. At minimum the master of ceremonies you know, when people hear the word MC, they think, yo, 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 but Master of Ceremonies is really the host. They keep the timeline running um, smoothly and efficiently. So, yeah.